Hello, and welcome to Bercadia's 2021 forecast webinar event. The event is now live. Please note that all lines have been muted and will remain muted throughout the duration of the event. Without further ado, I'll turn the program over to Justin Wheeler. Welcome everyone, and thanks for joining us for our webinar. I'm Justin Wheeler, CEO of Bercadia, and I'm joined by Bercadia executives and an industry expert to recap 2020 and discuss the themes expected to shape investor behavior and the multifamily housing market in the year ahead. Entering 2021, we are still living in challenging times, facing both a pandemic and economic uncertainty. That said, commercial real estate activity, acquisition, refinancing, and so forth continues apace. I'm very optimistic about our industry and especially our organization as we enter 2021 for many reasons. A tidal wave of maturing loans, coupled with historically low interest rates, a growing pool of yield-hungry investors, and continued liquidity support from government-sponsored entities all point to a bright future in 2021 and beyond. It has also been inspiring to watch our team take on the personal challenge of assisting our clients to find clarity amid the COVID-19 chaos, and from their makeshift home offices, no less. And I'm confident that that will continue into 2021 as long as necessary. Today, we're fortunate to be joined by Aneta Markowska, Chief Financial Economist at Jeffries Financial Group to help us better understand the current economic landscape and its impact on commercial real estate. Jeffries is our sister company and this webinar is yet another way that we have found to work together. In addition to Aneta, we had planned for Sam Shandon, Larry and Clara Silverstein, Chair in Real Estate Development and Dean of NYU Shack Institute of Real Estate to join us and offer his perspective on the multifamily housing market. Unfortunately, and as kind of the case now in these COVID days, uh, he needed to postpone his participation today. We do have plans to collaborate with Sam on a future webinar. After Aneta's remarks, we'll hear from several of my colleagues at Bercadia who will provide broader market context to our conversation, and then we'll close with a special Q&A session made possible just today. Many of you likely saw Bercadia's big news this morning. We announced the acquisition of the apartment brokerage practice of Moran & Company, expanding our focus on institutional investment sales. The transaction enables the launch of Bercadia Institutional Solutions powered by Moran, a platform dedicated to serving institutional investors nationally. For the closing Q&A, we will hear from Moran co-chairman Marianne King, who will be joining Bercadia as co-head of investment sales and head of Bercadia in Institutional Solutions powered by Moran. The conversation will be facilitated by Dory Nolan, Bercadia's senior vice president of national client services. We're extremely excited about what this partnership means for our clients, our partners, and our people. Moran's 25-year legacy in multifamily investment sales with a specialized focus on institutional investors will complement Bercadia's existing investment sales, mortgage banking, and servicing platforms, delivering greater access to fully integrated commercial real estate solutions for our clients. Marianne will be working with Keith Meisner, Senior Vice President and now Co-Head of Investment Sales, to lead the integration of 31 members of the Moran team, including 15 dedicated institutional sales advisors into Bercadia. Keith will also be speaking on today's webinar. So let's get started. First, I introduce Aneta Markowska, Chief Financial Economist for Jefferies, who will give us an economic update. Thank you for being here, Aneta. Take it away. Thank you very much, Justin, and uh, welcome, everybody. Um, I'm happy to spend the next uh, roughly 12 to 14 minutes discussing uh, the economic outlook for the U.S. economy, uh, and it looks uh, bright. I mean, we're obviously going through a pretty rough period at the moment, um, but I think uh, in the next few months, things will start to feel much better. So let's talk about the key themes that I see sort of shaping the economy in 2021. One is the great reflation. You know, we have the vaccine, uh, and now post the Georgia election, we'll likely also have very generous fiscal policy. And, and those are two pretty powerful forces that I think will generate very strong growth, not just this year, but over the next two years, uh, essentially bringing the U.S. economy back to um, kind of its full potential by the end of 2022. Um, the composition of growth will feel very differently this year than it has uh, over the past six months. Uh, Post-vaccine, not surprisingly, spending will likely shift uh, towards services. That's where we see significant pent-up demand. Um, and within CapEx, um, you know, which so far has been primarily driven by technology spending, 
we expect that to return to sort of a more traditional industrial investment cycle, which will also help to broaden uh, this job recovery. And that does imply higher interest rates. Um, we think that the Fed will be in a position to lift off in early 2023. So we think, you know, the market has some repricing to do there because the, the base case up until very recently was 2024. And so, yes, that will put uh, probably significant upward pressure on Treasury yields. So let's get started with some pictures. And I always like to start with, you know, where we are today. Um, and uh, you can see three different charts um, of you know economic activity the one on the left i think is particularly helpful because it's a it's essentially a real-time picture of the u.s economy which we create using a lot of alternative data um, and you can clearly see just how sharp the initial recovery was coming um, you know out of the lockdowns things sort of slowed a little bit in terms of the rate of improvement over the summer months and then we've really kind of taken a step back over the last two months. Um, and you can really explain the trajectory of the recovery so far with just two forces. COVID is obviously one, um, but also fiscal policy, which was very powerful, but very front loaded. And so, you know, that helped to generate the very steep recovery in the spring, but it also contributed to the slowdown toward the end of the year. Um, the good news is that help is on the way. So we, um, our government already had passed a new stimulus package into law in late December. That's in this top table here, and that was worth about $900 billion. And that is working its way through the economy as we speak, and I'll show you a few charts on that in a minute. Um, but now following the Georgia election, with Democrats now having unified control of the government, albeit with a slim majority in the Senate, um, but we think there's a very good chance that we get another substantial round of fiscal stimulus. Biden will actually unveil his plan uh, tonight. Um, we've assumed a trillion of additional stimulus. It sounds, uh, what we're reading from press reports, it could actually be even higher. So we're talking about a trillion on top of a trillion. And this is what it's going to do to disposable income. Uh, you saw, you know, you had that big spike in April. That was the result of the first fiscal stimulus package, and that certainly helped to drive the first leg of the recovery. And now, um, with you know, assuming that we get stimulus checks increased to two thousand per um, adult, with a lot of other additional uh, support for households and businesses, uh, we think disposable income is on track to actually have an even bigger acceleration by February. And as I mentioned, a lot of this is already hitting the economy uh, as we speak. So the top chart here is the stimulus checks uh, that the Treasury sends, um, or in this case, deposits and largely uh, directly into people's checking accounts through uh, um, direct deposits. And there was one big drop here. Uh, you can see that second spike. That was a week ago Monday when Treasury dropped $120 billion into people's accounts, so literally uh, helicopter money. And the last time this happened, which was in April on April 15th of last year, it created an almost instantaneous inflection point in economic activity. So again, right now things are looking a little dicey, but we think we're very close to another positive inflection point. Um, so, you know, this will obviously support consumption, particularly as we get into the second quarter, uh, which will, of course, coincide with, you know, kind of broadening vaccine distribution. And where we really see a lot of pent up demand this time around, and this is probably where a lot of the stimulus will be spent, is in the service sector. You can see that in goods, uh, consumers have been very aggressive. Good spending has been off the charts, well above pre-pandemic levels. Um, and so that's not where the future demand is. Um, we think it's going to largely come from the service sector, anything having to do with leisure, hospitality. And you can see a slightly more granular picture here, um, which kind of tells you which sectors are facing the most upside. Um, so, you know, we, we sort of, we, we've seen this big gap between spending on goods and services, and this has obviously had implications for the labor market because the service sector is very labor intensive. So this has cost us a lot of jobs, uh, but we do expect a lot of those jobs to come back in the next year and, and sort of fully get back to, to full employment by the end of 2022. Um, even though we don't see a lot of demand, final demand from consumers for goods, um, 
that doesn't mean that there is an upside for producers. And actually there's quite a bit. And the reason being that inventories in the retail space are incredibly low right now. And that's true for housing as well, uh, which is the bottom chart here on the left. Uh, in both cases, we're looking at inventory to sales ratios, uh, which we haven't seen since the 60s. So for most of us in, in, in our lifetimes. So a lot of building still has to take place just merely to catch up to where demand is today. And that's gonna support uh, manufacturing activity. Um, and so, you know, uh, again, very, very um, uh, constructive outlook for the economy for next year. There's another picture of, in, of the inventory situation. This is based directly on questions uh, that were posed to small businesses, large businesses, manufacturing services. And on both counts, when they're asked, you know, to, to kind of give an indication of their inventory levels, they are clearly too low uh, and really off the charts. So that's gonna be tremendous support for activity uh, this year. And with that, uh, what it's also going to do, it's going to normalize capacity utilization. So COVID obviously depressed production, um, and you know, it's hard to get capital investment when you're operating below full capacity. Uh, and so although CapEx has been strong on the technology side, it's been pretty sluggish on the uh, kind of traditional um, infra uh, I'm sorry, machinery, et cetera, side, industrial capex, and that's what we expect to really pick up in it by the second half of next year. And you can see kind of this, this divergence here within capex between technology and the more traditional old fashioned industrial capex. And we do expect that gap to close or at least to start closing in the second half of next year. Um, so this is, kind of pulling it all together. And I really didn't talk about housing because I think we'll hear a lot more about it later, but the outlook for housing is also very constructive um, in terms of supply, um, because again, inventory ra ratios are incredibly, incredibly low. So putting all of that together, you know, uh, there is a lot of support for growth here, both this year and really into the next year. And so we now think that we're gonna get back to pre-pandemic trend uh, by the end of 2022, and that will put the Fed in a position to raise rates by early 23. Uh, this is sort of a fresh outlook, which we updated immediately after the Georgia election. And we think the market still hasn't fully internalized what that will mean and, and the extent to which um, the, the very uh, kind of aggressive fiscal policy will accelerate our ability to get back to full employment. Uh, so this is where the Fed was in December. This was their uh, inflation forecast, and it's all about inflation for the Fed since they changed their framework. They've said very clearly that they will not lift off uh, the Fed funds rate until inflation gets to 2%. Um, and based on their December forecast, they expect it to get there by 2020, late 23, implying liftoff in 24. And so, as I mentioned, with this additional fiscal stimulus, that's likely to be pulled forward. So when you think about, you know, this obviously is an important driver of treasury yields. So, um, you know, the distance to liftoff is very important, right? So on January 1st, before the Georgia election, you know, we thought we were three years away from the Fed lifting rates. By the end of the year, we'll be just one year away. One, because we've moved the time frame forward by one year, but because we've also pulled forward the lift lift off. So we're essentially compressing that time frame very quickly. And that's what's going to put significant upward pressure on Treasury yields. So here's the 10 year Treasury sort of decomposed into inf uh, rate expectations from the Fed, just looking at what that average is likely to look like over the next 10 years. Um, and then a term premium, which is sort of a theoretical term, but it's a compensation that investors typically get for locking up their money for 10 years. And so um, we think there are gonna be pressures kind of from both sides, right? As I mentioned, we're gonna be shrinking the distance to lift off, uh, but the term premium, which is sort of the function of flow, that's likely to be pressured as well if the Fed pulls forward the tapering of asset purchases, which we think will be the case. Uh, and also when you think about potentially another trillion, if not two trillion of fiscal stimulus, well, that's money that the treasury is going to have to borrow and all that additional borrowing is also likely to put upward pressure on treasury yields. So we expect treasury yields to get to 2% by the end of the year. I know that's aggressive, um, but it's not unprecedented. There were three 
episodes in the last expansion where the 10-year treasury increased by 100 basis points within a space of 12 months. Uh, and, and, you know, those were typically uh, coincided with either tightening of, fis of monetary policy or generous fiscal policy. And in this case, we expect both. So um, there's a table here just summarizing our forecast. But again, uh, it's going to be... Uh, very constructive uh, the next two years in terms of economic activity with the only really question or risk is uh, the extent to which rates uh, back up um, and, and maybe sort of start to dampen activity at some point. But that's all I have. And now I will turn it over to Ernie Katai. Great. Uh, thanks, Justin. And thanks, Anetta. That was that was actually incredible and uh, optimistic. So I'm, I'm excited about that. Uh, you know, one thing we do at Bricadia is we uh, we take a powerhouse annual poll. We actually do it biannually. And what we do is we poll our investment sales advisors and our mortgage bankers. And actually, I love this because this is a boots on the ground insight. It's been interesting in the past where something seemed counterintuitive and we did the poll and turned out, uh, you know, these this group is usually right on. So, again, I'm just going to go through this relatively quick. It's a, a completely gear shift from the technical uh, presentation that Annetta just did. But, uh, um, you know, we're, we're in the middle of this recovery and to be, you know, we obviously don't know how long it's going to take, but we're certainly starting to get some momentum. And one of the things that I think is interesting as we polled our advisors is we really try to break it down into regions and see where the activity is, see where um, we're getting momentum and that type of thing. And I think if you look at what we see right now, 2020 was really interesting. Um, once again, the Sunbelt teams, uh, you know, rise to the occasion, looking at Southern California, Arizona, Texas, Georgia, um, did some of the high, highest sales volume in the company last year. And in, in looking at 2021 and looking at the survey results, uh, these regions uh, look like they have the unique demand drivers that are, continue, and, and, you know, stable occupancy for sure to drive this going forward. With that said, to drive down even further, we look at uh, places like the Inland Empire in California, Colorado Springs, Colorado. One that was interesting to me, Chattanooga, Tennessee, Sacramento, Raleigh, Durham. Names names that are uh, some are new, some uh, some we're used to seeing. But with that said, uh, it really kind of breaks down what's going on regionally with these things. And uh, we're certainly also keeping our eye very much on what the GSEs and, and uh, the rest of the lending community is doing. Uh, and in polling our bankers, um, you can see uh, that there's been 80% uh, of our bankers have said, look, primary lending is going to be coming from the GSEs. I think the good news to go along with that is we're really seeing a lot of activity and, uh, and demand on the life company side, along with uh, you know, our conduits and debt funds and that type of thing. So as far as capital goes, it's, it looks to be a good agreement. Um, you know, certainly uh, uh, we saw in 2020 a lender pause. Uh, the GSEs uh, certainly stepped up once again in a, in, a, in a situation where we were kind of guessing on what was going to happen and what the market was going to look like going forward. Uh, Hillary's going to talk uh, later on in this uh, webinar, and she's really going to get into the details of the cap and that type of thing uh, and give a mortgage banking update, which I think you'll find uh, pretty uh, official. Uh, one thing that was really interesting that, uh, you know, as we look at um, going forward, uh, interest rates are, are always going to be key and something we keep our eye on. I think we just heard from Anetta, you know, that uh, we probably are going to get rate increases about 12 months earlier than we anticipated. And, uh, you know, you look at the 2020 results here on the slide, about 53% of our group said they expected that to be kind of the number one thing. Uh, in 2020, and now it's up to 61% in 2021. The last few days, we've seen some some movement on rates. Uh, you know, we're certainly going to keep an eye on that very much, and certainly want to keep our network posted and our clients, such that we can give them any kind of insight that we see. Uh, and we'll watch the Fed uh, very carefully. Um, I think um, one thing that continues to be amazing about the multi-family segment is. What's coming online in the apartment side of the business? Uh, when you know it was 2020 was as strong a year as ever with 364,000 units delivered, and then we look at a 14 and a half percent growth for 2021. So again, optimism is there, and uh, you know 400,000 plus units 
being delivered uh, is going to be interesting to keep our eye on that. And absorption is something we'll also, uh, you know, uh, be keeping an eye on as it relates to that. Um, we're not we're done with COVID. We do understand that. Um, we're, in the, it was interesting, though, in the early days of the pandemic, about June, we took our, our second piece of the poll uh, in 2020. We did it in December of 2019. And 55% of uh, the Bricadians uh, uh, thought that it was going, the market was holding up better than expected. Uh, and now looking to our newest poll, it's accent of Bricadians said the market actually did better than we were uh, expecting. I mean, we all know that there's unknowns still are out there. Uh, you know, there's a vaccine distribution that's going on that that we'd all love that to be faster. It's still it's still taking uh, taking some time. Uh, Annette mentioned the next round of stimulus. Is that what that number comes to? Two thousand. We've got a, a change in D.C. with the Biden administration coming in. Uh, uh, we now have clarity on the Senate races, so things are to be somewhat clearer. Um, but, you know, the good news is uh, the markets are, are staying strong. The polling of our uh, Brigadians uh, keep that optimism right there. Uh, interestingly enough, the fourth quarter of 2020 was. Uh, uh, so, again, it shows you the resiliency of the market and the confidence that the investors have. Uh, I'm going to kick it over to Keith Meisner now, as he uh, is the head of our investment sales, and he's going to tell you exactly uh, what, what went on in the uh, 2020 year. Take it away, Keith. Thanks, Ernie. And uh, we're going to start off the comments today about deal volume, and then we're going to do some of these comments are going to be forward-looking and backward-looking, so just stay with us. Uh, despite a sharp drop-off in apartment volume in 2020 being down 25%, uh, 35%, excuse me, the apartment sector posted the highest annual dollar volume of any commercial real estate sector, finishing the year at $122 billion. Now, for comparison's sake, the industrial sector posted the next highest uh, total activity level of $86 billion. This should not be a surprise to many of you because the underlying fundamentals for both sectors remain so strong. It always helps to look at the stuff in context, right? Last year was a bit of a challenging year. And although the volume was down and clearly a disrupted 2020, Let's compare it to what happened in the global financial crisis in 2019. We went down to $17 billion in 2009. $122 billion for 2020 does not seem all that bad, okay? So what happened during the year? On the outset of the pandemic, investment activity became, came to a screeching halt uh, at the beginning of the pandemic. A lot of the institutional investors moved immediately to the sidelines. It is not uncommon for them to do this as they seem to be the last ones in and the first ones out is largely a function of the behavior. It's patient, defensive capital. Uncertainties surrounding valuations and rental collections cast a shadow over the deals from April to May. The only deals getting done were the deals that were already accounted for early in the year. But towards the end of May, things began to change. We started to see more clarity and confidence emerge, and I think that was primarily driven by the collections, as we could clearly see steady or improving trend lines. So, so some of that risk was there, and we started to understand it better and better. Then in June, boy, were we back up and running along with tremendous activity, and generally speaking, values were holding their own around pre-pandemic levels. This led us to the fourth quarter. Oh, if every fourth quarter could be like this. Massive activity in December helped power the fourth quarter across the industry to 42.3 billion. That was a 65% increase from the third quarter. Those of us at Arcadia experienced the best month uh, we've ever had, uh, just under $2 billion in sales activities. So let's go over to go kind of where did all that activity happen, okay? Well, it happened unevenly. Every market was down, but every market was down in varying degrees. Charlotte's volume, for instance, dipped roughly 9% in 2020. The abundance of white collar jobs, especially in banking, helped buoy the Charlotte market. Atlanta was another strong market comparatively. Overall deal volume fell a modest 12%. Some markets did not fare relatively well at all. Seattle and Los Angeles posted rather large declines of 62 and 50% respectively. Everybody was down and they were down in varying degrees. So now what about pricing trends? Pricing trends have remained favorable for apartments and that is great news. We've dipped 30 basis points on an average cap rate to, get to approaching 5.3% right now. Garden style deals feel, fared better than mid, -rate, mid and high rise. Private capital and 1031 exchange investors played a larger role in an acquisition activity last year, and this was not totally unexpected given what happened. 
while mid and high rise cap rates stayed relatively flat at 4.9% due to the investors pivoting and shifting their focus to well-located and suburban assets. So looking to 2021 and beyond, we, we remain extremely optimistic about the multifamily sector. We expect favorable interest rates and improving fundamentals will bolster and further the multifamily uh, sector as a plausible place for people to place money. Moreover, more groups remain extremely well capitalized, so it's already there. The demand is kind of there waiting to be deployed. And we know there's a huge sense of people trying to get back to business as usual mindset. They are ready to go. Long-term investor demand remains extremely strong, therefore. We also believe that the institutional capital, private capital, and foreign investors who were trying to see where the opportunities could be in the hospitality, retail, and or office sectors will continue to look at multifamily, diversify their portfolios. This is just going to create even more possible money in the multifamily sector. For 2021, we see three new investment strategies emerging. emerging. Specifically, we see the single family rentals transitioning from a niche asset class to a full-fledged asset type that investors will, be, will build strategies around, much like the student housing sector of a decade plus ago. And what this is, what I'm speaking of here is, you know, apartment complexes that are flat, single family type styled um, units. Additionally, for particularly in the institutional sector, we see a focus on the environmental, social and governmental strategies. The acronym ESG is something we are all going to understand more and more as the year progresses. Because investing in, in properties that adhere to the ESG guidelines, is ex those properties are expected to improve property operating margins. Communities at large are going to be better off to them, and it's going to help the environment. Institutional investors are going to be very driven to these types of uh, properties. And lastly, keep your eye out on hotel conversions to multifamily. As the hotel sector continues to languish and struggle as a result of the pandemic, we're going to see more hotels converted to multifamily. Okay, so fundamentals are next. 2021 will be a year of recovery and growth from a fundamental perspective. We anticipate apartment monthly effective rents to increase by 1% in 2021 and 4.1% in 2022. The trends driving this belief include skyrocketing home prices that will continue to drive demand for rental housing nationwide. Homeownership rate. Today, the national average homeownership rate is roughly 65%. We expect that rate to decrease to 60% by 2013 and 57% by 2050. Job growth is expected to outpace pre-pandemic levels in 2021 at 2.6% growth and 2.9% growth for 2022. Population growth and household formation are on the rise. The renter population will persist as Americans in the key renter age cohort for renting 18 to 35 year olds are expected to remain at least in the 22% range for the next five years. Across the country, we believe that rent appreciation will be the highest among secondary and tertiary markets that experience above average job growth. Specifically, our data demonstrates the Sunbelt markets have been more resilient to the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic than the gateway markets, and we anticipate that trend continuing. I don't think that's new news. With lockdown restrictions, higher costs, renting, the larger population, in California and New York, it's not surprising that San Francisco, New York, and Los Angeles noted the largest net move out figures over the past year. Amplifying this migration from dense urban markets is a number of major corporations, such as Microsoft, Shopify, Twitter, Facebook, that have all announced the permanent option of working remote for employees who, who choose to do so. However, we are not writing off the urban markets just yet. We see this as a temporary setback and believe that once, vac once the vaccine effectiveness takes hold, that could encourage millions of renters to, re to return to that great live, work, play environment that urban, envi urban environments can only provide. And finally, where is all this activity happening and what should we expect for 2021? We've identified a market in each region to keep an eye out on. Southern California, the Inland Empire market as of late has become the darling and the investors focused on in the Southern California region. Now, that's due to its proximity to Los Angeles and comparatively lower housing costs. Effective rent is, ex we're projecting effective rent to increase 6.7% in 2021. That's above the national average of 1%. That's pretty impressive. In the Mountain West, the Colorado Springs market is anchored by five military installations, so that's good, 
and they're even adding more as the government is expected to further boost its presence there with a new consolidated space operations facility. That's a mouthful. With employment nearly making a full recovery since March, this apartment market in Colorado Springs has basically picked up where it left off already. Now, Texas, Texas job engine is Dallas Fort Worth. It will be revving back up in 2021. By year end, it's anticipated that payrolls in half of the metro's employment sectors will meet or exceed the staffing levels recorded just prior to the pandemic. That's huge progress. This will be underpinned by the anticipated net migration of over 57,000 people to the metro area this year and continued corporate re relocations to the market. And lastly, or no, almost lastly, the Southeast. While transaction activity in Atlanta was nearly non-existent immediately following the onset of the pandemic in the second quarter, Atlanta set a record for quarterly deal volume in Q4. Values appear to be holding up as most of the deals that completed in recent months have come in at or above pre-pandemic pricing. The Mid-Atlantic, with an expected uptick of federal spending, 20, 2021 is poised to be an unbelievable year for the DC multifamily market. What's happened recently in the last market, we had more private investors making the moves and making things there and institutions are on the sidelines. We expect 2021 to see the institutions back and searching for core deals in the DC market. And finally, the Pacific Northwest. The Seattle market maintains its position as one of the most highly advanced and diversified economic economies in the country. What we saw in 2020 when it's numerous firms expanding outside the city limits of Seattle. Cities like Bellevue and Redmond have welcomed major employers seeking relief from the taxes that exist in Seattle. We anticipate this trend to continue and we see investors following that trend to the suburbs in Seattle. And again, I really believe that's gonna continue throughout the rest of the year. Thank you for your time. And now we're gonna flip it over to Hillary for the debt markets update. Wow. Um, <laughs> thanks a lot, Keith and Ernie and Annetta. Um, that's some great market intel and some very insightful projections. And hopefully I can complement some of that with a capital markets perspective. Uh, I also wanna thank everyone that's joined us today, both our customers as well as our lender partners who I know are out there on the phone. And it would be a major understatement to say that 2020 didn't go off exactly the way that most investors and lenders expected it to. But I think as you've heard, um, both Berkadia and the market um, can be really proud about how the industry adapted from a, a lending standpoint last year. And although the 2020 figures aren't final yet, the MBA is projecting that the commercial and multifamily mortgage bankers will have closed about 395 billion of loans backed by CRE in 2020. And that's a 34% decline from the 2019 record volume of 601 billion. And kind of as you heard from Ernie and Keith, although we saw um, all capital sources recording a decline compared to 2019, originations backed by industrial and multifamily properties saw much smaller declines than other property types. And the multifamily lending here was supported primarily by uh, loans made by Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and FHA. Now, looking at final year and volume numbers, Fannie Mae had reported 65.7 billion of new, new business origination through the end of November. And that was within 500 million of where they were for 2019. And we don't have official estimates, but the unofficial indications show that Fannie's December volume was around 10.3 billion. And if confirmed, that would put their total year-end volume around 76 billion, which um, would indicate they used 94 billion of their total volume cap um, in the five-quarter FHFA allocation, which is great. They got very close to their goal. Similarly, Freddie Mac had reported 65.6 billion through the end of November. And it was funny, as of uh, the writing of this, this morning when I was putting it down, we didn't have their final numbers. And somebody literally just texted me that they did put out their final year end numbers as we were uh, speaking today. And they announced that they hit their 100 billion five year cap that was allotted to them which would indicate um, that their 2020 fundings in December were 17 billion, which is amazing. So clearly a huge fourth quarter of originations for 
um, multifamily agency lender lending across the board. Um, now, all of us are wondering, what does that mean going forward? And as most of us know, FHFA released the 2021 volume scorecard for both agencies in November, and they lowered the annual cap from which, what was about $80 billion annually to $70 billion each in 2021. And despite this reduction in the volume caps um, and some of the changes they made to the affordability requirements for the agencies, we're still very, Burkadia is still very bullish on kind of their lending capacity for the year and the prognosis for the sector. Um, one of the things that's kind of dominating the narrative right now with both agencies as we go into 2021 is how big their pipelines were spilling over from last year. I mean, I think you all got, you all just heard how big the fourth quarter was. And given the limitation of 70 billion each, they both find themselves needing to kind of manage their capital successfully to even out their pipelines throughout the year. So because of this, we're seeing the agencies not being as aggressive as they were in the fourth quarter quoting new business. Um, but that being said, there's still liquidity from the agencies. So it's just not as aggressive as it was in the fourth quarter. And they're really prioritizing affordable and mission rich workforce housing business, as well as their small owned pro product right now. Um, but as Ernie says, as we kick off 21, Burkadia anticipates um, much uh, higher increase in availability of other capital sources. And we think they're going to pick up the slack where the GSEs may be limited. And that includes life companies, banks, CMBS, and debt fund um, executions. And the other thing to remember is even if the levels of liquidity don't prove to be enough from the GSEs, a Biden administration could potentially make leadership changes at FHFA, which I think we'll all be watching for. And they can also adjust the GSE caps mid-year. So I think um, we're watching that as well. When we look at pricing in the market right now, um, despite the volatility and widening over the last eight weeks, it really has never been better. Um, you know, Annette talked a little bit about where we think the 10-year Treasury could be going at the end of the year, so that's something to keep in mind. But today, um, you know, we're not at the lower, um, like the historic low that we saw mid-year, which was, I think, 60 basis points. But we're still, I think the last time I looked, at a 109 basis point Treasury rate, and that is far lower than the historical average. And remember, this time last year, I think we were at a 188. So still great low rates right now. And, you know, you can combine with this with the fact that spreads on agency guarantee bonds, Fannie, Freddie, and HUD, are among the tightest they have ever been. Um, so when we look at all-in rates, 10-year interest rates on agency paper, it's generally at a low 3% all-in rate. It's well into the twos, depending on your leverage level. Higher leverage will be in the low to mid threes, and lower leverage will be closer to a 275. Uh, when we look back on 2020, and you know, at Burkadia's um, origination volume, we did almost 27 billion of volume for our clients across our various lender programs. And believe it or not, it was actually ahead of our 2019 volumes, despite the pandemic. One major highlight was our HUD, HUD originations, which were up almost 200% from 2019. And our HUD pipelines remain the strongest they've been in our company history. We're also proud of the fact that we will rank as a top three lender for Fannie, Freddie, and HUD in 2020. And we're grateful for the important stability that they have obviously provided to that market. But we continue to leverage our large network of non-GSE lenders, including banks and life companies. And of particular note, when we look at life companies, we've seen a sharp increase in loan velocity since September. And the life company's primary appetite is for multifamily, industrial, uh, grocery-anchored retail, and selective office deals. And interest rates for life companies are in the low 2% range for high quality sub 60% LTV deals. And then we'll get into the upper twos and low threes for deals where leverage exceeds 
And we're actually seeing, um, in order to generate origination volume, we're, we're absolutely seeing the life companies go to higher leverage up to 70%. Despite the volatility in the market last year, Burcadia closed nearly $2 billion of life company business. And we were proud of that because the market was down probably 40% for life company originations, and our volume was down closer to 25, which was great. Um, on top of the financing sources I've already talked about, local and regional banks are still being viewed as highly competitive options, especially in, you know, for local sponsors. And then the national money center banks will be aggressive for their strongest repeat clients. Um, a surprise was actually credit unions had a breakout year in 2020, and we expect this to continue with more volume um, from credit unions this year. The CMBS market that Ernie mentioned contracted probably about 40% from volume levels in 2019, and this was due to the pandemic kind of decimating hotel and retail lending opportunities, and there was just a dearth of financeable properties there. And we anticipate CMBS will slowly regain relevance as these property markets um, start to recover. Now, as many of you know, Burcadia actually boasts a structured finance group that trades in preferred and JV equity. And we saw this arena slow down considerably in the middle of 2020, while there was uncertainty around the pandemic and property fundamentals, as well as travel restrictions. But what we're seeing now is activity uh, pricing and leverage levels there actually back to normal, and in some cases better than pre-COVID from an equity standpoint. Now, capital is being very selective, and there's a flight to quality with sponsorship. And like we've heard um, numerous times, industrial and multifamily asset classes are kind of the darling here. One thing we're watching is overseas capital has been less active. But now that we have more certainty around the U.S. political structure and um, the anticipated ability to get back to traveling, we do expect to see an increase in activity from these valuable offshore equity sources. Finally, um, I'll transition a little to some specific property types. We anticipate a rebound for seniors housing in the second quarter of this year. And it's been dry for the last four quarters, understandably. Um, but with vaccines being administered now over the next three months at om almost all seniors housing properties, we expect a significant uptick on product operations and then the related financing needs there. And then similarly, we're really bullish on the hospitality sector heading into 2021. As the vaccine is distributed more widely, we expect a large initial bump in leisure travel. I think all of us are ready to get back out to some nice hotels again. And then um, a gradual increase in business and group travel. We think asset sales and note sales are gonna lead the charge in Q1 and Q2. And then we'll see an increase in the capital markets from a hospitality standpoint in the second half of the year. Uh, we expect the market for affordable housing to really continue to grow in 2021. And this is going to be fueled by increasing investment interest, the continued low interest rates, and there is a wave of affordable properties hitting the end of their initial tax credit period, which is great. The regulatory environment for affordable has also improved with the greater prioritization under the GSE cap regime, which we talked about, and there's an increase in federal subsidy from the recently fixed 4% tax rate, which will help affordable financing as well. Now, one weak spot here has been the demand side for LIHTC equity, and we're going to be keeping an eye on that. The potential for a higher corporate tax rate during the Biden administration would obviously spur an increased demand for tax credit equity. So that's something that could actually help that side of the business. So to sum up, um, we obviously have many reasons to be enthusiastic about the state of the CRE and particularly the multifamily capital markets as we start the year. Burcadia anticipates an increase in our lending volume for 2021, and I'm very excited about our team's opportunities to demonstrate to you, our clients, um, our superior execution ability here. 
So with that, I am now thrilled to turn it over to Dory Noland and my newest Berkadia colleague, Mary Ann King. So welcome, Mary Ann, and take it away, ladies. Okay, great. Thanks, Hillary. I wanted to echo my excitement with respect to Berkadia's acquisition of Moran's investment sales practice. We're using the acquisition of Moran as a catalyst to expanding our institutional prowess. As Justin mentioned earlier, we're launching a new specialty group, which will be known as Berkadia Institutional Solutions, powered by Moran. This group will be dedicated to serving institutional investors nationally through Berkadia's robust suite of services and resources, combined with Moran's strong institutional investor partnerships built on trust, client service, and collaboration. As Justin also mentioned, Marianne King, co-chairman of Moran, has joined Berkadia as co-head of investment sales, working alongside Keith Meisner and head of uh, Berkadia Institutional Solutions, powered by Moran. Please join me in welcoming Marianne King to Berkadia, her second day on the job and today's webinar. <laughs> I have the great pleasure of being able to ask Marianne a few questions today, such as why Berkadia? And what exactly <laughs> is your vision for uh, Berkadia Institutional Solutions powered by Moran? So let's jump in, Moran, or let's jump in, Marianne. Why <laughs> did the Moran team choose, choose to join Berkadia? Well, thank you so very much, Dory. Um, it is so good to be with you today and all of the uh, Berkadia family and friends as uh, we all, I think, embark with an abundance of hope and optimism on this great new year. Um, so Tom Moran and I have um, been engaged in conversations with Berkadia for about six months. And I think uh, certain advantages of our partnership were very clear to all of us from the very beginning, but others really came to light over time as we uh, got to know each other better and really be able, um, really became able to discover the, the really the power of our partnership. So from the outset, I think we could all see that Bricadia presented a really great opportunity to uh, serve a broader range of investors nationwide and to grow an investment sales platform. You know, Berkadia has a national uh, footprint with over 40 offices and an average deal size of uh, $20 million. It's clearly one of the best and the most robust middle market national platforms uh, in the industry. On the other hand, Moran was, has been a boutique platform that focuses most of its efforts on institutional sales in six major markets. However, our average deal size was about $70 million and even more on the coast. Um, and as you might expect, our client base was overwhelmingly institutional. And because there was so little overlap in the geography of our coverage or in the clients that we served, we both knew that together um, we could really serve a broader range of clients, both middle market and institutional, across a broader national footprint. So from the outset, I think we also knew that Bricadia's mortgage banking capabilities would be a huge advantage for um, the Moran clients. As you all know better than I, Bricadia has one of the best debt platforms in the business. Year in and year out, it is always number one, two, or three in Fannie, Freddie, and HUD originations. Um, so it's easy for us to see how helping prospective buyers underwrite the most competitive debt solutions would help them increase the pricing on marketed properties. Um, but there were other aspects of the Bricadia opportunity that I think only became clear over time. So sometime during the last six months, um, we were introduced to Bricadia's state-of-the-art technology platform called Pixis. Now, for those of you that haven't had the opportunity to see Pixis, this is an information source like nothing I have ever seen before. Um, I've kind of um, compared it uh, to driverless cars. I've said Pixis is the investment sales business, what driverless cars is to the automotive industry. And as I watched several uh, demonstrations of this um, uh, software product, I saw um, the access to um, so much information that I knew that my institutional clients would find immensely valuable uh, in their investment decision making. Over time, I think Tom and I also met many of the people in Bercadius leadership, and we began to recognize an extraordinary cultural brand that was very important and very familiar to both of us. 
So I think together, Bercadia and Moran, we share a very client-centric and collaborative mindset. We share um, a focus on our people and a commitment to integrity and excellence. Our cultures are really very perfectly aligned. We also got to know Bricadia's leadership, and we developed an increasing respect for them as business builders uh, and enthusiasm for them as partners. You know, Bricadia is a very, very young company, and yet it has grown um, since its inception in 2009 to be, really be a powerhouse in both mortgage banking and institutional sales. So I began to see that the growth, that its phenomenal growth, was really the direct result of the strength of its leadership. Bricadia's leaders are really great business builders. Um, Tom and I thought that the Moran partners brought a great deal of apartment expertise to the brokerage business, but I have already learned so much about uh, business building from uh, Dustin and Randy and Keith. And from that respect, I think grew the enthusiasm for the partnership that we could continue to build. So those right, are my Martin. reasons. Thanks, Marianne. And I would agree, just having spent so much time with the Moran teams over the years, you know, when I was at Capri and, and buying and, and um, assets as well as Moran selling for them and just, you know, having been at Bercadia for two years, um, I think our culture and the leadership is very compatible. So I, I agree with a lot of the um, comments that you mentioned earlier. So what is your vision for Bercadia Institutional Solutions Power Moran? What is it? And um, how do we think that this is going to help our institutional clientele on a go-forward basis? So what is Bricadia Institutional Solutions powered by Moran? Well, it's uh, definitely a mouthful. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but I think the words were chosen very, very carefully. So Bricadia Institutional Solutions um, uh, powered by Moran is a really newly created specialty group within Bricadia that offers institutional clients kind of a customized capital market solution to meet their uh, real estate investment goals. So when I think about it, I really drill down on two of the key words, institutional and solutions. And um, this is what I think about um, when I think about that title. So institutional um, clients tend to own either larger assets or large portfolios of smaller assets. Many times they're more complex. Um, they could be in uh, assets in mixed use settings. They could be on leased land. They could be encumbered by complex um, financing. They could have affordable agreements that are um, uh, more complex. Um, perhaps they require a deeper uh, value add to really unlock the value of the investment. Um, or perhaps it's a portfolio of assets in a really diverse geographic footprint. So these types of assets uh, demand more sophisticated representation, and often not just a single broker, but really a suite of specialists. And it's that suite of specialists and special tools that Bercadia will bring to the table in its institutional solutions business. So the first tool, um, which I mentioned earlier, is Pixis. You know, that information technology will really help all of our investment advisors uncover the most compelling story um, backed by real-time data that supports irrefutable trends that will help Bercadia's marketing team make and support arguments for outsized investment growth, which in turn should drive pricing. Mm -hmm. Bercadia will also bring its really unrivaled debt expertise to the table. We all know that the best debt vehicles can really increase equity returns. So if our mortgage bankers can help buyers source the very best debt, then their clients will be able to bid a higher price and win the deal. Bercadia's mortgage bankers with expertise in the kind of debt most likely to drive pricing on any particular deal will join our suite of experts. Bercadia will also bring talent from its affordable group to deals that have a complex affordability structure. It could bring um, to its specialty team um, the other team from JV Equity and Structured Debt um, for assignments that are in search of uh, uh, development capital. Bercadia can also bring its investment advisors with the most relevant real estate experience to its suite of experts. You know, um, 
throughout its history, Dory, and you know this, Moran has really consciously hired investment advisors with really diverse real estate backgrounds so that they can provide a more sophisticated evaluation of the value add opportunity in every investment. And we intend on bringing those experts into our suite of resources for institutional clientele. And finally, um, we'll bring our rainmakers uh, with the best access to buyers, uh, with the hottest source of capital for any particular type of investment into the suite of resources for every institutional execution. So these are the tools and the suite of uh, resources that Bercadia Institutional Solutions will share with its institutional clients. But all of you, all of you that are with us today, you can't possibly understand um, the power of this suite of resources until you see them for yourself. So I hope you will give us a call and invite us to show you the value that we can unlock in all of your apartment uh, investments with Bricadia Institutional Solutions powered by Moran. Thanks, awesome. Dory. Awesome. Thank you so much. And I'm super excited again about the alliance with Moran and building out this specialty group. I think it's going to be quite special. And I think our clients will definitely benefit from the commitment um, and the service that we'll provide to them. Um, so thanks. thanks again, Marianne. And now I'll turn it over to Justin Wheeler, who will close out our uh, webinar for today. Justin? Yes, thank you. Thank you so much, Dory and Marianne. That's awesome. I got the, I got the uh, chill just sitting there listening to it, so I appreciate that. Uh, with that, we'll bring our discussion to an end. Thank you all for sharing your insights. Thanks, Annetta, Ernie, Hillary, Keith, uh, Marianne, and Dory, obviously. As we've heard today from the team here at Bercadia, we were pleasantly surprised by the relatively nominal impact the pandemic had on multifamily property fundamentals in 2020. While we have a ways to go in our economic recovery and many health and policy change factors remain up in the air, the outlook for multifamily is optimistic. Thank you again to our partner, Annetta, and our friends at Jeffries for sharing her insights and a final thank, thank you to everyone who joined us on this call. As a reminder, a recording of this webinar will be available shortly, as well as the results from our latest powerhouse poll that uh, Ernie referenced. Our full 200, 2021 forecast an analysis of national multifamily trends paired with market-specific highlights is available for download on Bercadia.com. As always, please don't hesitate to reach out to any Bercadia professional with questions or follow-up. He or she will direct you to the right resource, get you the answers and insights you are seeking. We are here for you. Thank you.